just to give you a little background about this webinar, I'm sure many of you have attended the seminar I did last month in ISCG about the future of jobs. And during that seminar, we realized that there is a need for many people to go through a little bit in detail to understand the LinkedIn and what LinkedIn can do to benefit your career. So that is how we, we decided to hold this webinar. And I think you also know that as a follow up this webinar, I will be holding a couple of workshops personally at ISCJ. So we also did a while ago a leadership program at ISCG which was also went very successful and uh, many of you attended that program as well. So I know there are new people who may not be uh, familiar with me or my background. So a quick introduction. I have spent my life in corporate in different regions and different uh, part of the world. Until 2014, I was working as a CFO in a global manufacturing company based in New York. And at that time, I decided to leave that job behind and started my own consulting or training and coaching uh, activity, which is you can see at the screen is called CFO Academy. This is my full time job now. And I think I have some understanding how the market is moving into and what professionals have to really do to cope with the market. So we all know that we are passing through a rapid, rapidly changing environment. And for many people, I see that it's really in a struggle how to really understand, how to really digest what is happening and then make adjustment in their uh, career journey. So purpose of this webinar today is really to focus on LinkedIn. And as I said that uh, hopefully, inshallah, we'll follow up this with a couple of in-person workshops at ISCG. Before we jump into the LinkedIn functionalities and details, I want to share with you a broader sense of the environment in which we are living and in which things are changing faster. And few new re part of the new realities are number one, lifespan of skills used by employee is shortening, is reducing. So I understand that majority of the community is really dominated by IT professionals. And who could know that better than you guys that look uh, not today in this current environment, but even for a long time, the fastest changes in the skill set requirement were happening in the IT function or IT industry. So you are all very familiar with that. But also for all other skill sets uh, and other functions and profession also is changing very fast. So that's a universal phenomena that life's span of skills is really reducing faster. And it is really no more about degrees and certifications because many companies like Amazon and Apple and Microsoft, they are basically looking for a skill set. So even if someone has an MBA degree done 20 years ago, and if they cannot do the job, then what these companies do, they are very result oriented. So the focus of the companies are changing to more towards a skill rather than really degrees and certifications. So that's another new reality. And a skill gap is widening. So what employers and the companies are looking for, the generally speaking, the supply side is not able to offer that. That is why the skill gap is widening and I'll elaborate on that in a while. Then average work tenure is also shortening. So my father worked 40, for 40 years in one company. I'm not sure if it is uh, uh, possible to find such examples, uh, but experts are saying that average professional will have 10 to 15 changes in their uh, lifetime career. And then technology or IT is not only a separate industry, Technology is really invading so many areas of our life that it's basically becoming an integral part of every industry. So you may be an IT professional, but your branding or your specialty is also related to which industry exposure or experience you have. So every industry has a major chunk of technology in it. And then informal education is becoming mainstream. So as I said, that the employers companies are not really uh, demanding too much degrees and certification they are they're asking for a skill set and it is becoming easier for the professionals to learn quickly with a lot of online programs available or short programs available wherever and then based on that they are able to really good employment opportunities and disruption so we hear this word again and again disruption and it's really becoming a norm it's no more a disruption it's becoming a norm in different industry so we should be really prepared for any disruption in our industry or in the environment we are really working 
as corporate professionals. So this is a little journal overall view or the background in which we are we are going to talk about a few things specific to LinkedIn. Now, this is an interesting chart which you see uh, on the screen. This is actually showing some numbers by country. And the if you look at the headline, this is showing labor cost savings. So we all know that for the last 20 years, the low cost countries, especially the India, China and other developing countries, they have a cost advantage in terms of the manufacturing and production. And that is why a lot of jobs shifted and moved from developed countries like USA and Europe to those countries. Now, what this graph you're looking at your screen is showing is based on the automation and robotization of the developed nations. So you see is starting from South Korea and then Japan and then Canada and United States. Now, these numbers showing in these bars are basically the savings, the labor cost savings they are able to achieve because of the automation and robotization. So just think of this, that is really changing the game entirely where in the last 20 years, those third world country, developing countries have a cost advantage for manufacturing. Now the developed nations are becoming more advantages from a cost point of view. So how would the thing take place? It's just an imagination that more and more jobs would, it's now cheaper to really produce goods in those developed countries than developing countries. So that's a big game changer. Game changer. Because of the, of course, automation and emerging technologies. Now, also, there is another very important change happening. This is also related to the uh, skill gap. We all know very well about the blue collar and white collar, right? And we understand the meaning of that. There is a new term wide spreading very fast, which is called new collar jobs. And new collar job is basically very latest term. I think it was coined by the IBM CEO not long ago in 2016. By definition, it is a new collar worker is an individual who develops technical and soft skills needed to work in the contemporary technology industry through non traditional education path. So first of all, for new collar, you don't need any formal certification or degrees. Number one. Number two, of course, you may have some technical core skills, but you are also required to have the soft skills, the leadership skills, the emotional intelligence, the critical thinking, the strategic thinking, complex problem solving. That is what is meant by new collar jobs. So it's not blue collar or white collar. It's a combination of your technical core skills as well as your soft skills. So it is becoming a more of a requirement. And that is one part of the skill gap. Because any jobs available in the top companies or the large companies, they are looking for more skilled worker, more talented worker, which means that, yes, you may have some technical skills, but why not also have some managerial or the leadership skills in combination of your technical skills? So this is a growing requirement, especially in the technical industries. But I think this is also spreading very fast in all industries, this type of requirement. And what is the future of work? So things are changing so fast and experts are really trying to make predictions or speculations. So future of work is not only about emerging technologies. Of course, there is a lot of talk about blockchain and advanced analytics and artificial intelligence, but it's more than that because these emerging technologies is definitely driving the change, but now it is impacting every aspect of our life, personal and professional. So it's more than emerging technologies and it's more shifting towards independent workers. So I know that many of you are uh, uh, freelance, freelancing or the contract workers or consulting work. Now, more and more economy, not only in IT, but in all other industries also shifting towards this trend that there is more independent workers, self-employed workers, freelance workers, which is called gig economy. So big corporations are not hiring as many people as they used to. They hire few people, but more talented, more skilled and many jobs they outsource to self-employed people or the freelancers. Another trend is about the transparency of performance. So with the technology, now many companies are allowed their workers to work remotely from home or other places. Why? Because there are there's a technology, they could really monitor the performance very closely. And that is true even for the workers who are in the workplace environment because of the technology the performance has become very transparent, which means that if you are really performing well, 
you could be rewarded very fast, very rapidly. And if you are not performing well, you could also be exposed very fast, very quickly. So it's a transparency of the performance in the new environment. And then it's going to be a talent war. It's already happening that generally what is happening, there are a lot of jobs, by the way. So those of you who are uh, looking or seeking for jobs, and I see many people are struggling, it's not that there are no jobs. It's because of the skill gap that the, what the corporations are looking for, it's not generally available in the market. So I would say that it's uh, like 10% and 90%. There are 90% crowd who are looking for job, but they are not offering the set of skills which is in demand. And there are only a handful of skilled and talented workers for which there is a talent war going on. So the companies really want to hire those talented workers. If it is not 10%, it could be 20%, but it's not really in high number, uh, absolutely. And future is not about jobs. As I said, the economy is shifting towards a gig economy. It's about work. So if you have a job, you are working, but you could also work on your own. If you are a freelance worker or a consultant worker, it's also not about salaries and compensation. It's about income. Because if you are a self-managed, self-employed contractor or consultant, then you are working and you are getting income. So these are the new realities which are taking place in the work environment very fast. OK, so for any professional in any field or any industry, this is the criteria that going forward, you need some basic core human skills. What are the human skills? Creativity, critical thinking, communication, interaction, collaboration. These are the things or these are the skills which robots or the machines are not expected to do in the foreseeable future. So the question is that whether my role would survive in among the emerging technologies or not, the criteria is quite clear. Any job or any work which is repetitive, which is routine, which is process oriented, probably machines can do much better than human. But what human could do in terms of the creativity, critical thinking, communication, people management, collaboration, machines are not really geared up, at, at least at this moment. So that, that's an area where we need to focus upon in terms of developing our skills for the future. And as I said, that disru disruption is becoming a norm. So we need to really prepare for disruption wherever you are. And disruption is basically change management. Now, we hear this term change management in terms of in relation to the corporate environment. Here we are talking about from an individual perspective that wherever you are, you may be happily employed in your job for several years and you have no intention to really move to another job or another opportunity. But look, the way the environment is changing, it may not be your own desire, but it may be the circumstances and conditions outside your control, which will create a change. So the message here is that we need to prepare ourselves for any change or any disruption may happen in our way. If you look outside in reality and, and soon based on the autonomous technology for the vehicles, it looks like that there would be no jobs for drivers. So there are 8 million drivers in US alone, the commercial drivers, 8 million. And imagine that if those 8 million people are jobless in some years, you could question whether it's five years or 10 years, but there is no doubt that they would be out of job. Now, I don't expect those drivers or uh, other people in other industries to remain out of work. Of course, they have to do something. So they will learn some new skills and they will do some different jobs, but it will take some time. That is what we call the job disruption, that moving from one job or one type of a skill to another will take some time and it's not easy. It would be painful for many people. So the message here is that look, try to look into the future and see what changes are coming up and how could we be proactively develop our skills to really make it easier for us to go through those job disruptions. Now, this slide you might have seen earlier. I used that in my some other presentations. This is from the World Economic Forum Future of Jobs report. That report was issued in September 2018. And what this is a very important information. What they basically reveal in the slide that by 2022, 75 million jobs would be lost because of the changes in the technology, changes in the business model. 75 million jobs would go away. But the good news is that 133 new million jobs would be created, created. 
So there is a net gain of the jobs. Now, that's a good news. But the reality is that for people, 75 million jobs which are being lost, these people have to go through a significant job disruption to learn new skills because 133 million new jobs are basically not the existing jobs. They are the new type of roles where people have to learn those skills. And if you look at the categories of the different type of roles, you can see there is some trend. If you look at the top 10 declining, of course, these are the routine jobs. These are the repetitive jobs. Uh, any machine or robots could do that. And what you see in the top emerging is more technical and more human related skills. So that's one very slide, which is uh, basically the background of this discussion. And the businesses are really jumping to adopt the technology very fast. As I showed the other bar chart, where we are, uh, you saw the cost saving in the developed and industrial countries. So imagine how much saving businesses are achieving. Technology is not really expensive, like it used to be in 70s, 80s, and 90s. Technology is cheap. So it's not really a question whether they should or they should not. It's only a question of when they should do it. And businesses are not leaving any opportunity unturned to adopt the technology because it's really saving them significantly in the, not only the cost, but efficiency, quality, and effectiveness. So what can we do for the skill gap in demand and supply? So let's talk about the employment industry or recruitment industry. How is it working? And as I said that you may be happily employed in your current job and you may have not no intention to change your job. But look, future is so uncertain that it may not be in your own control. It may not be based on your own desire, but the, you, you might be forced by circumstances to make a change in the job. So a skill gap in this slide, what you see that there is supply available, but not what employers are looking. So they are really cherry picking the talent. If there are 10 candidates in the market, they really look at the one or two, which really meeting their demand, and they are ignoring eight. Now the eight candidates are frustrated, rightly so. And they don't understand that it's not because there are no jobs. It's because their skills are not really current or not really in demand. The big question is that, look, if things are changing so fast, so how should we prepare for our our jobs or our profession? Now, it is not, according to experts, it's really not clear what role would exist or what roles would go away in future. So, for example, if I'm a CFO today, I really have no idea, no, don't know whether five years, 10 years from now, there would be a role of CFO or not. So roles are very uncertain, but what is certain that a skill set would be required. So what we could manage from our own side as a professional is not the roles we are doing or we would be doing, but our skill set, which we would use currently and we would be using in future. So this is another slide from the same report, World Economic Forum Future of Jobs report. And in this report, if you look at the two set of skills, there are 10 declining skills and there are 10 growing skills. Now, Look at that list. And again, you can find a clear trend. The skills, now keep in mind, these are skills, not the roles. So skills which are declining, they are more like repetitive tasks. They are routine tasks. They are simple things, which could be picked up very quickly with machines and robots, right? Look at the list of the skills which are growing and just focus on the trend here. So it's talking about analytical thinking and innovation, active learning, creativity, originality, influence, then critical problem solving. So trend here is that in the growing skills, we are talking about the unique human skills, which are not expected to be taken over by robots. Now, what role would you do? We don't know. But if you have these skills which are growing in demand, there would be some roles where you could fit in. So if you just focus on your current skills and develop them, and there would be some roles available in future where you could apply those skills. That's the best you could do in terms of managing your skills. Now, the same report, Future of Job report, says that 
if you, by the way, that report is not talking about 10, 15, or 20, 30 years. It's talking about 2022, which is just three years away, right? So it's very close what they are talking about. And they said that if you don't learn new skills or new things which are required to keep you survive and thrive in the professional environment, it will take more than 100 days of learning if you have to really catch up. If you are not really aware, you're not doing anything, learning new things, by 2022, you need to spend at least full 100, more than 100 days to catch up just to get there where you should be by that time. So this gives you some intensity of the need of learning. And learning is really not about really going to a three day or five day program or a course. It needs to incorporate in your daily schedules. Look like you are on a, on a weekday, imagine this. I feel a little guilty to really pull you into this webinar at this time, but we are sitting here at 9 p.m. on a weekday and trying to learn something. That's part of become part of the lifestyle, right? And I promise you that what you could learn in one hour could be more than if you go to a typical traditional training workshop for a day. So it's not about really doing some training programs or courses is just grabbing the opportunities of learning in our day-to-day -day environment. It should become part of our daily schedules and our lifestyles. Let's talk about the recruitment process. So in older, good old days, what used to happen that there was recruiters or employers and there was a lot of candidates, right? And we are talking of pre-internet era. So just think of those that are, and some of you might have been active at that time. How the recruiters would connect with the candidates they would use newspaper ads, very common at that time. They would use employment agencies and they would use word of mouth, right? These three things or there are a couple of other things serve as a middleman because recruiters, employers have jobs, but they don't know how to reach candidates. So they would use these middlemen and that is how once the candidates find the opportunity, they will apply for those jobs and that is how recruiters would know about the candidate. So it was basically, candidates driven market in order to get the job you need to apply and you will get connected to the recruiters or employers this was pre-internet era now what happened after internet that the same two parties they connected differently and this time it was the middleman was basically internet with internet recruiters do not need newspapers with internet recruiters have already access to large masses of candidates. So the process reversed, driven by recruiters. So recruiters could drive the process by looking, going into the internet and finding out the suitable candidates to drive that process. Now that internet basically, over a period of time, shifted into LinkedIn for job placements or job search. So LinkedIn today has become the biggest job board in the world this this has become the biggest place for job searches and job placements so i'm sure many of you might have used it but i still believe strongly that more many people still do not realize the power of linkedin i i was surprised some people i interacted some believe that linkedin is not able to give you any jobs and they were asking that whether the linkedin really you could get a real job or not and uh, i'm sure there are mixed experiences, but LinkedIn is the most powerful platform today for managing, not only getting jobs, but managing, developing, and thriving your career. Think of this. Your future employers are already on LinkedIn. Your future boss is already on LinkedIn. Your future colleagues are already on LinkedIn. Somewhere, there are 600 million professionals on LinkedIn. So it is 99% expected that your future colleagues and bosses and employers are already there. And if you are not there, then you're missing, missing a huge opportunity. So, as I said, experts are assuming or telling us that there will be 12 to 15 job changes, which means that, as I said, that even if you don't have any intention, you need to at least be familiar with the process that once you are out of job from one place, then how could you really transition yourself? And losing a job nowadays is really not a bad thing. Because as I said that there are very few jobs people are using because of the performance issue. Most of the time is mergers, acquisition, downsize, upsize, right size, wrong size, whatever you call it. 
beyond their control. So it's really a reality and a normal thing. The only thing we are suggesting here that we should be prepared for that phase. And that phase would not happen once in a lifetime or once in your career. It will happen again and again. So it's a good idea that we need to learn those skills, how to really place ourselves in the market, position in the market, and look for new opportunity. Now, unfortunately, most people, when they first time encounter this situation that suddenly they find themselves out of the job, they're not prepared for it. They don't have a training and education for it. And they did not really experience that phase, that process before. So it becomes very experimental in a very pressurizing environment and condition. So keeping employable is more important than being employed. Now it's okay to remain out of work for a few months, but if you are not employable, if your skills are becoming obsolete, that's a much bigger issue. So in order to keep ourselves really marketable, we need to learn personal marketing. Now I know many people don't like that and don't believe that they should do any personal selling or marketing, but look, folks, this is inevitable. In new economy, this is inevitable. You have to run your own career like an entrepreneur. And for that purpose, you need to really learn marketing and do marketing. And personal branding is so very important because as I said that LinkedIn is very fruitful place to find jobs. But look, there are 600 professionals. It's a hell of a job to really be look distinguished among 600 million people. So what businesses do? They try to do branding to differentiate themselves. And that's what we need to do as professionals to personal to create a personal brand for us. And it's not about really loyalty and uh, deep relationship with your current employer because all jobs are temporary. All jobs are temporary, but your profession is permanent. So this is what I say for myself. Look, I don't know how long I would be working for an employer when I was working, but I know that probably I would continue to work as a CFO or as a finance professional. So look back at your career and your professional profession. Probably that profession would continue for the rest of your life or career, but your employer would keep changing. So it's not about loyalty with your employer, but loyalty with your profession. And very important reality of the world. Your value is determined by the perception of others. Now you may think that you are very competent, very qualified, very talented. It doesn't matter what matters, what other people think about you. So again, now this sounds unfair, right? I fully agree with you, but look, the world is unfair. We are living in an unfair world and we need to prepare ourselves to deal with this. So that becomes part of your personal branding and marketing that unless you tell the world what you bring to the table, how would they know it about it? So it's your responsibility that to let the world know about your talent and then they will offer you the opportunities to use your talent. So now we are getting close to the LinkedIn and the, the, the thing which you could do that. So resume, I see that it's still 90% professionals are very, very focused on your their resume or CV because this is what they think that in order to get a job, new opportunity, you have to have a very outstanding, excellent, perfect CV and resume. Well, I have a bad news for you. Unfortunately, resume is getting dead. It's not completely dead, but it's really almost dead because recruiters and employers are not waiting for your resume. If they need, if they have a job opening or they have an opportunity, they just go on the LinkedIn and there are some advanced tools available for them. So recruiters and employers, there is a tool called Recruiter, which gives them access to a lot of very fast, suitable candidates. So if imagine this, that even at a senior level, if a recruiter has a job and that recruiter has to find a candidate, they need just 50 prospective candidates. So they would go on the LinkedIn and use those tools and find out 50 prospective candidates. And that, that's all they need to narrow down to two or three final candidates, right? Why should they go and post the job on job boards and go through a deal with 500 or 1000 or thousands of resumes and CVs? So yes, there are jobs on the job post and be careful, there are very many fake jobs as well. But, and many recruiters are using job boards and they invite resumes, but the, the uh, talent market is really shifting more towards 
the search on their own rather than really inviting inviting candidates to submit their resumes they started to search online because linkedin is big enough 600 million professionals are the big pool to find the right candidate so your linkedin profile is the new resume not many people are realizing that and i every day i look the linkedin profile of different people and i get shocked because they have not worked on their profile for years and it looks very outdated and that is why you are being missed out of those opportunities because if a recruiter is searching candidate and you are not visible and you are not really look distinctive you are completely missed out of that opportunity nobody will ever ask for your resume so very important critical thing is to be visible not only visible but also look attractive on LinkedIn so they could find you and they could approach you. Of course, once they find you, they talk to you. And if they believe you are the right candidate, they will ask your copy of resume. So don't discard it completely. But most of the cases, first time, first opportunity would come through LinkedIn profile of the connection. So job search process, as I said, that it's not only for the job seekers right now, it's also for the very happy well settled people who do not have any intention of any searching for any new job because as i said the job tenures are reducing so soon i hope not but soon you will find yourself searching for a job so what is job search process it's very simple actually there are just two critical steps number one getting an interview number two getting a job right now majority of the candidate job seeker do not get it right they mixed up in the sense that when they are trying to do the first step, they have the target of second step in their mind. So one of the biggest mistake candidate would do, they try to dump each and everything on their resumes, their whole life on their resume. So you look at a typical CV and resume, it looks very noisy, very crowded with eight to 10 pages. Nobody has time to go through it. Now, problem is, because in the mind of the candidate, they are targeting getting a job. They feel that I should not miss any important information on the resume. Completely wrong mindset because your objective at that stage is not getting a job. Your objective is getting an interview, right? So to get an interview, you only need to create a curiosity, not really convince on the piece of paper that you are the right candidate. How do you do these two steps separately? Number one, Create visibility. So again, if you understand the new process with LinkedIn, you have to be visible on the LinkedIn, right? And also with a strong personal brand. If it is strong enough, if you could be found by recruiters, they will ask, they will contact you and ask for an interview. Now, the purpose of the interview is just to verify your personal brand. So. In a typical process, they are searching on LinkedIn and uh, assuming that your LinkedIn profile is very strong, powerful, it comes up and they look at the profile and feel that, yeah, this is the right candidate. They would call you or they would send you an email with, with some proposal. And if that works very well, then they will invite you for an interview. Why do they invite you for an interview? Because they just want to verify their perceived value. When they look at your profile, they develop a perceived value, which looks like that you match the ideal candidate. So they approach you and they invited you for an interview because in interview, they want to talk to you to ensure that your reality matches with their perception. And that's a process of getting job. And in interview process, no matter how complicated it is, how many psychological tests are there, finally, it's a matter of just one conversation with the, with the, uh, with the hiring manager, the decision maker, one conversation. And that conversation really convinced them that you are the right candidate. So if you look at this process separately in these two steps, I think that clarifies a lot and will help you keep your mindset with the right focus on the each individual steps. So how do you ensure that you are visible on LinkedIn, right? Your visibility test. If you are not visible, which means that if you cannot be found, you can feel that, look, I already have a profile, but nobody really pays attention. You're not visible. 
It's your obligation, your duty to make it visible. So if you're not visible, you do not exist in this world, honestly. So start Googling yourself. That assuming that as if a recruiter is searching someone and put your name in the Google and see what comes up. That would give you first idea that how much visible you are. For some people, few results may come up, no results may come up, or some lot of results may come up. That shows your visibility. And ensure that you are visible on LinkedIn, number one, but also Facebook and Twitter. Now, you don't need to spend a lot of time on Facebook and Twitter. It's just for the sake of presence. Because if someone is offering you a job, keep assured, not only they will spend sufficient time on LinkedIn to research you, but they will also check briefly on LinkedIn and Twitter just to ensure that your information is consistent across the uh, different social media platforms. And also, if you could create your own personal website, please do that because today it's very simple. You can create your own website in half an hour. There are so friendly tools available. That's also another way to really showing your profile or you're showing your personal information along with your LinkedIn profile. It increases your chances of visibility if you have a personal website. And try to decorate your profile with videos, blog posts, articles, news, and pictures. So I'll give you one analogy. Let's assume that you go to a mall and you want to buy one simple item. Let's say your, your shaving cream or some toiletries. And there are a lot of shops around. And you look at different shops. There is one shop with no display, but it says toiletries. And it looks very dull from outside. There is another, another shop which you know it has a lot of stuff, a lot of variety. And there is a lot of item on display, not only toiletries, but garments and clothes and jewelry. It looks very colorful. Which shop you tend to move into? Of course, the one which is well decorated, right? Although you need just toiletries, but you probably would go to the shop which is well decorated. Think of your LinkedIn profile exactly like that. If you have a very brief information, very dry with no decorated items like video, blog shops, or blog post articles, etc., it looks very dry, uninteresting things. But if you decorate it with, for example, write a couple of blog posts, write some articles, put your pictures from your graduation or from your award ceremony in some corporate environment or some other activities, it looks colorful. That is what we call decorating your profile, which increases your chances of visibility and being picked up. And your personal brand, your personal brand is basically ensure that how other people see you. So as I said earlier, that thinking or believing that you are a very talented, skillful person is not enough. It doesn't count. What really counts, what other people think. And that you could achieve through personal branding creating a brand that people look at and believe that you are a talented and skillful person. And this is done by showing your achievement and accomplishment in your profile. So many people really struggle. They just list their job title and maybe some period when, when they started, when they finished. That's not sufficient. That's not explains your talent. You need to show your achievement. What did you do if you are working for five years in a corporation? You must have done some good things. What are those good things? Just list them proudly on your LinkedIn profile. That is what we call decoration and that is personal branding. Also, what are your skill set, transferable skills, which you could take to other jobs, other industries and your activities outside work. I mean, if you are very active in sports, it doesn't hurt really to include some information about your sport activities because it will show your personality. Employers and recruiters are very interested to know in detail about the talented candidates and their their background, their lifestyles. So you have many opportunities to really put on LinkedIn and of course your connections and networks. So imagine a recruiter has a very compelling opportunity and they are looking for some ideal candidate and they come across your profile. And if your profile is only showing 50 connections, what impression they are getting? They think that you are an introvert you have no social connections. You basically are confined, even if you may have a PhD degree. But look, 
we are talking about perception. So you may say that, no, I'm very outward. Somehow I couldn't really pay attention to my number of first level connections. Well, that has become your brand. 50 first level connections has become your brand. And based on that, people make their interpretation. So you are missing a huge opportunity. And of course, your positions and titles. Be careful what you list. If in your career background, there are some unrelated junior positions, avoid them. You are not required to disclose each and everything. Now, don't misdeclare, don't misrepresent. But you are not supposed, you are not required to put each and everything. If something is out of context, ignore that. Take it out. Try to make it a very powerful profile. And also ensure that any negative information on Internet anywhere about you is not there. So that I know that there are a lot of tools available to search your information negative. Uh, do that uh, whenever you have a chance. And in, in fact, I would suggest you to once in a while, every few years, run a background check report on yourself. So I'm sure that you know that whenever you're employed by a company, formal company, they always run a background check report on you. Why not you do that before they fi find anything wrong? Why don't you know that? So it doesn't hurt. It's only cost maybe $15, $20. But I think it's a good investment to ensure that there is no negative public information about you anywhere. Networking is another very important activity you could achieve through LinkedIn. And as a matter of fact, I personally believe that networking today is a lot more easier with the social media. So in earlier days, you have to really go to networking meetings to meet strangers. And today you could do that much better, much faster and much professional way. So going to events, it's useful, but don't go to the event just to meet strangers or just to expand. You could do that through LinkedIn sitting at your place. And I will, I would share with you uh, several techniques where you could do that very easily. By the way, uh, when I started my uh, networking activities, I have very few connections. Today, my network on LinkedIn is close to uh, plus 25,000. Now, it has been done over a long period of time, but I have done it entirely on LinkedIn. That's a power. And also, imagine that when you were doing networking and going to a networking meeting and trying to talk to a stranger, assuming that this person is very resourceful and they might help you, how uncomfortable it is to even initiate the conversation. Now, what you could do through LinkedIn, you could warm up the connections, just warm up, know each other, don't even don't talk. But once you meet after warming up, you feel very comfortable. And I have tried that several times. There are a lot of people. I knew them. I connected on LinkedIn. Then we exchange a few short notes. And once we personally met when the opportunity came, we were so comfortable as if they are our uh, longtime friends. And also, I know that many technical people, especially the IT people, they think that their core expertise is technicality. So they are really expert in it. And they don't pay much attention to the business side. As I said, the trends are changing. We are moving into new collar jobs and new collar jobs are in more demand or new collar professionals are more in demand. So please, besides your technical skills, try to develop some business knowledge and that would make your job not only more enjoyable for you, but also increase your perceived value for other people. So take a few courses formally or informally on business or business strategy. Understand the value creation cycle of your business and try to understand basic finance basic because financial are the language of business in terms of profitability, sales, growth, those things. The basic thing you need to really understand and try to expand your network also to the people who are in other professions, different professions. You could really have some uh, good orientation by networking with them. And please wherever you want to show your uh, information, mainly on LinkedIn, but also on your resume, find out what are your achievements, not your role and responsibilities, but what are your accomplishments and achievements? Because that is what really appeals to the employer. That really helps to show your very compelling and attractive brand to other people. So develop a mindset, first of all, because some people I talk to, the, to include their achievement and accomplishment, 
they counter ask me that I don't have any achievement and accomplishment. Now, I said, how long have you been working for that company? They said, five years or 10 years. I said, how is it possible that you did not do any achievement and you are still there for five, 10 years? So what you need to do, look back, whatever jobs you have done in the, in the past history and go deeper. You must have done some good things and try to distract them and put it with some powerful words. And that would become your results and achievements on your resume. Again, my criteria don't misrepresent, but try to present it in a, in a smart way. So it could really create opportunity for you. And also develop short stories about your successes. Whenever you deal with, you don't know when the opportunity would come up, right? So develop very short one minute stories about your successes. You could talk during an informal conversation. So here come the LinkedIn part. So folks, I have a lot of contents. I'm not sure that I won't be able to really share everything in this uh, short session because this is late evening. So I also don't want to stretch or extend it beyond one hour. So I will show you quickly what I have to share with you. And let me also introduce you to the workshop we are going to do in the next couple of weeks. So the my objective here in this session was really to give you a sense that how important is LinkedIn. And if you are not really working on LinkedIn or spending time on LinkedIn, then how much opportunity you are missing out because it's not your fault. Somehow you did not interact with the re relevant or right information to realize that how critical LinkedIn has become. So we we would we have a lot to share on the LinkedIn. Let me cover a few pointers quickly. So it's, it's a very good place to expand your professional and business network. As I said, you don't need to go to the networking meeting. It's also a place to attract recruiters and job leads. It's also to display your achievement. Now, many times you don't feel comfortable telling people about your achievement and accomplishment. Well, LinkedIn is the right place. Just put your information over there and even your boss may go there and read it. So the beauty of LinkedIn is that you really don't have to declare yourself as a job seeker. You just put your right information in the right way, right manner, and it's working for you already. Because when recruiters try to find out candidates, they are not searching who is looking for a job, who is not. They know that 90% of the people are always open to new opportunities. So when people write on the top of their profile, looking for opportunities, seeking for job, actively searching, it's basically adding something negative to their profile. It shows their desperation. And in view of the most of recruiters, those are not the ideal candidate. The ideal candidate for recruiters are the people who are not looking for jobs, who are very happy in their current jobs. That's what they are looking for. So you, without really declaring yourself as a job seeker, just put your profile and profile is working for you. Because I tell you, based on my 30 year experience in the corporate world globally, best opportunity would come to you when you are not looking for opportunities. Also, you could use LinkedIn as to display your authority and expertise. So this is really a very blessing, I think, for your professional development, what you could achieve through LinkedIn. So I'm going to show you just the topics now. So this is my whole presentation. I'll show you the topic because I don't want don't have the time to complete it. But let me show you what I, I want to cover. So LinkedIn is a gold mine. I cover that. I have LinkedIn, your LinkedIn profile. So how to really make it very compelling and very attractive and, and visible. And there are some challenges with the LinkedIn. Then we have where are the senior level jobs? I have some uh, some bullets and pointers over there. Mindset for success with LinkedIn. Then uh, Building up your network, there are a few tricks and tips. Sending invitation, then accepting invitation, keeping your network active and alive, your profile views, establishing your expertise and thought leadership, LinkedIn groups, how to use them, networking and relationship. So what I want to talk now is to communicate with you that how critical, crucial LinkedIn is, and then introduce you to this workshop we are doing so I showed you a few slides which I wanted to cover today, but we don't have time. But this workshop in-person session, 
we are doing for almost a full day. So it's a live in person. I would be doing personally myself with you. And because of the some logistics reasons, we have to conduct in two parts. So we will do the first session on this Sunday, 17th March. We'll start after Dohar prayer, 4 p.m. and continue until Isha prayer. In between, we'll have a Maghrib prayer break. So that would be the one day. And the second week, second Sunday, we'll do on March 25th, the same time, 4 to 8 p.m. So this would, together, I think it would be close to seven plus hours. So imagine how much I could teach you about LinkedIn on seven hours and how much you could learn. And that would be very practical because here I'm just sharing the tips on these slides. But in that workshop, I want to show you by opening the LinkedIn application and show you with some examples and profiles how you could do it. And that is why we needed more time. So that's what we are going to do, not in a hurry, but in, in, a, uh, in a formal manner with sufficient time. We will do that in the multipurpose room at ISCG. I'm sure all of you are familiar with that. Now, there is no fee for this workshop. I'm doing it entirely, completely free of cost. The, this is my obligation to ISCG and ISCG community that whenever I have some time, I try to provide some value. Uh, for you, we are suggesting or asking that if you could donate $50 uh, to ISCG in the name of this workshop. So again, this is all going to ISCG. So it's really win, 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 not only win, win. I'm getting satisfaction to really providing some good service to you. You are getting a lot of good training, which will help you significantly in your profession and career development. And ISCG is getting some benefit. We did the same thing a while ago when we did the leadership development program. That was for six or eight weeks. So we asked people to pay $300. And I think 30, 35 people did that. So that was really a good class. 50 is just peanuts, I think. For this level of workshop, I mean, if you go to our LinkedIn workshop with this quality for one day, it would be 500 at least. So it's a good bargain. And so what you need to do, pay at the ISCG website and there is a donate button. Just use that donate button to pay $50 and you get an electronic receipt. Then just forward that electronic receipt to brother Asad Mazarullah. His email address is here. And that is how you will get registered. So thank you very much, folks, for attending this uh, webinar at this time at this moment. I hope it was useful. And this is only a uh, glimpses what you could do on LinkedIn. And as I said, I have a lot of information which I really want to like to share with you interactively in detail through showing the actual practical demonstration. So with that note, uh, let me thank you one more time to all of you uh, to making yourself available at this time. And I hope to see you at the workshop. Thank you very much and good night now.